All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this panel session. And as the panelists come up, I would just say that uh, I'm really excited to bring together these three awesome VCs uh, to share their perspective on investing in cloud native AI. And you know, not only do I have a ton of personal respect for Astasia, Natalie, and Eric and their investment track records, you know, they're they're longtime friends of the CNCF ecosystem and a bunch of the leading companies within it. And I think if you, you know, spoke with them, you'd find that they understand the spaces that make up this community and this landscape really, really well. So excited for this conversation. We'll kick off with some brief intros and then dive into insights around investing in cloud native AI. Hopefully you'll hear some investor real talk as part of the discussion and then we'll leave it open to some questions from the audience. So start, I'm Wei Lian Dang. I'm a general partner at Unusual Ventures. We're a seed stage VC firm. Uh, I primarily focus on infrastructure software. I was previously founder of a company called Stackrocks, one of the earlier cloud native security spaces, uh, security companies, um, and before that spent time working on products that, uh, you know, things related to cloud native infra at CoreOS, like Kelsey uh, and AWS. Hi, I'm Astasia Myers. I'm a GP at Felicis Ventures. Felicis is an early stage focused VC fund. Enterprise software is the majority of deployed capital, both app, security, AI, and infrastructure. I personally focus on infrastructure and AI and actually got to know Way by being an investor in Stackrocks back in the day. Hello, uh, my name is Natalie Vase. I'm a general partner at Spark Capital. Um, we're a multi-stage fund. We have about eight billion under management. Um, I work on the early stage team where I focus on seed and series A investments in cloud infrastructure, developer tools, and AI. Um, I uh, previously, previously spent three years at Amplify Partners, which was a pre-seed seed fund, specifically focused on infrastructure and dev tools. And before that, I spent about a decade working on databases and distributed systems um, as both a systems engineer and later product manager at companies like Oracle and Google. Hey, everyone. I'm Eric Nordlander, a general partner at Google Ventures. Uh, Google Ventures is an independent VC uh, with Alphabet as our sole LP. Um, I lead our New York office and also cover developer tools and infrastructure for the group. Um, I've been at the firm for 14 years, and before that, I was a software engineer at Google um, since the early days working on backends for things like Google Search, Gmail, and ads. Awesome. So, you know, we have senior folks, decision makers from, from some really great VC firms, and I think this panel is going to go by quite quickly. I'd like to start off by just covering opportunities in cloud native AI. And Natalie, I'm going to start with you. You know, if, you, if we think about the, cloud, uh, the technology inflection around cloud native, which started about 10 years ago, I mean, it led to tremendous value creation. Many new products, thousands of companies, billions in funding. But the, you know, who captured that value was sort of uneven. You, know, you had a lot of the incumbents that were able to monetize Kubernetes, and some of the more notable startup exits were in specific parts of the stack, like networking, security, or observability. And so as a venture investor, you know, we're in this midst of this likely larger inflection around AI, and we see massive amounts of funding going towards foundation model companies, code gen companies, and so on. You know, where do you think, in terms of emerging areas of cloud native AI, you know, what do you think is most going to be most valuable? And, what are you focused on investing in right now? Yeah, that's a great question. And if I knew the perfect answer, um, you know, we'd be perfect investors up here. But uh, my first job out of college was at Oracle and everything was on-prem. That was back in 2014. So I definitely saw kind of the shift to cloud um, as it happened over the past decade. What I'd say is we're still in the early innings of the cloud native shift, uh, even though we're here at a con um, at a conference focused on what is mostly cloud native technologies, there's still a large majority of people that are still um, doing that transition. And in the midst of this, we have another shift happening, which is the shift to AI. And so I think what we're really interested in as investors is the intersection of the cloud native technology shift uh, plus AI. Um, and we think about it in two areas. Number one, the application layer. And number two, the infrastructure layer. I'm very much focused on the infrastructure layer, but you can't ignore what's happening on the application layer because that drives all of the infrastructure changes. Um, I would say that you know one thing I believe is actually not all infrastructure needs to be rewritten in this new age. Um, Kubernetes is a great example. 
You had OpenAI on stage seven years ago talking about how they had a seven, you know, 7,000 node cluster um, running behind OpenAI. That shows you that a lot of the infrastructure we have today can be adopted and adapted um, for this new cloud native meets AI world. So what I'm really excited about is to see the companies that are already out there and how they shift and adapt to the new world and these new workloads, in addition to what new primitives we might also see. Eric, Astasia, you know, where, where do you both each see some of the biggest opportunities around cloud native AI? I would say that the categories that are interesting as an investor in infrastructure really don't change macro trend to macro trend. Where do you make money? Compute, data, tooling, networking. That, that continues to hold true. We are very excited about the data layer. We think that the data has always been the crown jewels of the business and continues to be so with Gen AI. We are particularly interested in unstructured data. So if you talk to IDC, they talk about how you know, 90% of the data that has been generated ever was generated in the past two years. Of that, only 10% was structured data, 90% was unstructured. With Gen AI, now you have text, image, video, and voice, all types of unstructured data that you can better utilize, either by doing your own pre-training or post-training. Within unstructured data, we think about four buckets. One is data quality and data curation. Two is data extraction and ingest. Three is unstructured data processing. And then four is the data management layer itself. So we are investing across all four of those categories at this time. And so if anyone's building there, we'd be really excited to talk to you. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with a lot of what's been said. I think, you know, ML is nothing without all the data and you need all the infrastructure that's around to, you know, support even bigger amounts of data. I think I've heard numbers like there's gonna be 100 zettabytes stored in the cloud, you know, sometime this decade. I mean, these are just staggering numbers. You know, since we're all infrastructure people here, I think what is interesting is that these large ML training infrastructure workloads are causing a lot of change. I mean, literally from the silicon on up, and that's a very exciting time to be investing because things that have kind of been ignored or the same for the last 20 years are now being rethought. And so, especially around, um, you know, training and doing inference on smaller models, you know, I, not everyone here is gonna be building a foundation model company, but we'll, you'll be probably training some smaller models around your use case. The infrastructure is very nascent, and I think there's a huge opportunity to deploy capital there. And then, you know, to your point, all the way up to the application layer, there's going to be a new set of tools uh, just because of the, the world we're in. So I think it's an, an exciting time both for a lot of the existing infrastructure and for everything that we have to build to support, you know, basically LLMs everywhere. Eric, just on that last thing, you know, sort of a resurgence or renewed interest around silicon and things like that. How do you think about like capital intensity when it comes to, you know, setting up companies for success and, you know, what's required, you know, if you want to go build new chips versus like you're focusing on software only? Uh, you need an iron stomach. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're in this company, Light Matter, which is doing very well now. It's around kind of inter uh, silicon photonic interconnects, which are super interesting um, for large ML workloads. but you know, I call it like a seven year overnight success because they had to really grind it out in the sort of pre LLM era um, and it wasn't easy. And so, you know, this is what's so great about investing in software. Things are much, much simpler than when you have hardware and tape outs and big capital costs and things like that. But that being said, uh, if you look at the amount of capital that's gonna be spent on both CapEx and OpEx for ML data centers, it's just staggering. And so things that were maybe rounding errors in terms of e efficiencies now translate into, you know, hundreds, if not billions of dollars of improvements. And then, you know, that's something that you can invest behind. You know, I want to say to, you know, Kelsey was earlier bringing up that you know, the ecosystem has tons and tons of open source projects of which, you know, some have really, you know, some have led to really successful companies. You know, Asasti, I want to ask you, because you do a lot of work in, Open source, I mean, I, th I think the community has been tremendous at supporting and helping make successful a number of open source projects. And part of that is because users start with open source in many cases as a preferred mode of getting started. But in AI, 
that's not always the case, right? Like users getting started with OpenAI or Anthropic or like proprietary platforms. Like, what what impact do you see open source having on uh, you know AI? And you know, are you actively investing in open source AI companies? Yeah, great question. Um, I will repeat what I said last time, which is. I fundamentally believe the same principles and values of the past generation with cloud native just will be applied to the future with AI. Open source is a very, very compelling business model. I've done over 15 open source investments, Diagrid, Dragonfly, Dagster. Um, you know, some of them are downstairs booths. Please go check them out. Um, I think that open source as a business model is compelling for a number of reasons. One is it lowers the barrier to adoption to developers like those in the crowd. You can start using it, it's free. It enables you as a founder to get into large enterprises without going through security and compliance. Two, you have community-led uh, growth so that you can actually have users in the community act as references and champions. They're contributing, they're advocates. It's amazing for lowering customer acquisition cost. And three, we always see this movement of proprietary closed source and the counter kind of uh, maverick approach of open source going after the incumbent. We see this in AI as well. You see Mistral going after open AI. You see Facebook getting in the, the race with Llama models. You have orchestration solutions like Langchain. You have database companies that are open source first, like uh, Chroma and Superbase. So for me, there's nothing new about the application of you know, open source towards a new macro trend, it's always going to be there because no one wants to be at the behest of a few large companies who kind of dictate the future of a community. You know, the, the three of you have all worked with open source companies. As board members, how, how do you advise founders on how to think about, you know, prioritizing, you know, adoption and community building and, you know, more grassroots, grassroots bottoms up um, user base as opposed to, you know, when is it the right time to start focusing on monetization and early revenue traction, you know, enterprise commercial product, like how, how do you strike that balance and how, how do you, you know, what do you typically advise your founders who are having to navigate that and, and when? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, I work with probably 90% of the companies I've invested in have an open source component. And I think what's really good to remember is that open source by itself is not a silver bullet. There's many companies that have not succeeded to commercialize open source as there are that have, and maybe even more so that have not succeeded. Um, and I think what's really important is to create a flywheel where the open source, um, you know, is, is something that you know, is, you know, feeding its own community, but you ultimately have to build a product. And what I think about is this differentiation between a technology and a product. And a lot of people build a tool and a technology, but a product is something that someone can purchase and buy. Um, similar to what Kelsey said on the panel, um, you know, ultimately a product is a service and you have to figure out how you, uh, you know, turn the open source project into something that can be packaged and consumed. Um, I think how we advise companies is, um, you know, I think everything is different. Like every every company is different. I spend a lot of my time in the database world, and there's actually a pretty good playbook for how you build a commercial service around a database. Um, you cannot say the same for every type of open source project, but for databases, it's often about providing um, you know enterprise level services, SLAs, um, enterprise features like logging, etc., around the open source project. Um, and I think um, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say databases is an interesting use case too because uh, commercial licenses were 65, 35 in terms of uh, where they were with open source until three years ago and open source and commercial are now 50, 50. So the market has spoken, people like open source as a model for databases. Just to add on to what Natalie was saying, I think it's really important to clarify popularity is not value and it doesn't mean you'll be able to monetize. Like if you take away anything from this talk is that you could be the most popular open source framework and you could actually not be providing that much value to people. It could just be really uh, high profile, lots of eyeballs, you know, secret, no one actually cares about GitHub stars, we care about usage. And um, you know, you have to figure out what you're providing to the market, what vo void are you filling and are people willing to pay for it? These are all three different things. Yeah, the only, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. And the only thing I'd add is open source is marketing. 
it's, it's, it's a great way to market to developers and it's really effective, um, but it's on sales, right? It's, it's definitely not sales. And I think the struggle that I often see in the boardroom for many open source companies is, is it too good? You know, and th this is a tough thing. It's like great to get growth on your open source and all the stars and everything else, but then if you're asking people to pay and there's nothing worth paying for, y you, don't, you don't really have a business, you have, you have a problem. And so I've seen a lot of companies that then have to kind of, you know, walk back the open source and that's really unpleasant, right? Because people don't like taking something that's free and, and pulling it away. Um, so I think it's really important that, you know, even if you're open source from day one, to think about like what the strategy is and play that out over the next several years. Because again, once it's out there, it's out there. You know, it's very hard to put the cat back in the box. Um, I have a quote I want to share from a founder I work with. I don't want to misattribute it because I think he's quoting someone else. Um, but he, he had this quote, which is that open source is too expensive for a small company and too cheap for an enterprise. Um, and I really liked this quote because for smaller companies, it often is too expensive to run that open source themselves. They don't have a platform team in house to do it, but enterprises don't want to use something for free. They want someone they can call when something goes wrong. And so I think that captured for me this nuance of how you build a business around open source. Um, so if anyone knows who that quote's from, let me know. <laughs> the the three of you all invest early. You know, for for companies that are built around open source or open source source projects, how confident do you need to be that there is a straight, you know, a straight path or straightforward path to monetization in order to invest. You know, I mean, there's categories of developer tools where you know monetization maybe seems a little bit less clear. Some more questions around it. You know, just for for you and your you know each of your firms, like how how do you think about evaluating those opportunities? I mean, also you know we talked about databases a little bit. I mean, I think that's one where it's it, there's a pretty easy path. Um, anything that's usage space is, is pretty easy to figure out. The only thing I'll say around developer tools is, you know, developer tools has been a little bit sleepy maybe for the last 10 years in terms of really big outcomes, lots of monetization. And the thing that's really changed it, I think, has been AI. Like now we're seeing people willing to spend tremendous amounts of money to drive efficiency in developer tools. And so, you know, not that everything is about AI, but I think that if you have a clear path to driving some sort of consumption base, you know, whether that's AI tokens or anything else, you know, it could be uh, cloud stuff, um, CPU cycles, like that, that, that usually ends up being how these things get paid for. So again, I don't know that at the earliest stages, all of that needs to be completely figured out, but we have to believe that there's a path there and that there's a path to something quite significant. Yeah, I think another thing that we talk about is like the shift in buying patterns. So I think 10 years ago, most software was bought top down, um, where you'd have to go get the stakeholder who, you know, was in charge of the org and they would do the PO. Um, but now the developer is a very empowered buyer within organizations. And I think that's what's led to new business models like PLG. I don't really like that term, which is why I'm air quoting it, um, because I think all growth should be product led. Um, but there is this idea of individual buyers being empowered, developers being empowered to you know, sign up to your product with a credit card and the ability for that to grow over time. And I do think that's quite different and emergent for developer tooling. Um, but ultimately, you do have to capture those uh, enterprise contracts. Even these companies that start bottoms up um, do grow ultimately to having, you know, having to figure out enterprise sales at some point. You know, there's tremendous velocity in the space of cloud native AI, just in terms of innovation. I mean, we're seeing all sorts of things come out around model deployment, inference, you know, so, some st things that are actually substantively very technically difficult to tackle. And I think for that, it's a really exciting time. If I could analogize, like I think in this ecosystem, a lot of its, a lot of its growth is owed, you know, Genesis is owed to sort of the, the technical work that was done on something like Kubernetes, very sophisticated, complex, you know, Eric, I might ask you because you're a longtime technologist and former engineering leader, what are some of the frontier or like technical breakthroughs in AI right now that you're most excited about? And, and do you think that they are easily monetizable? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. I think, I mean, the, on, on one hand, it feels like there's a breakthrough with AI, you know, every every day of the week, and um, it's maybe hard to see through all the hype and understand kind of where things are going to be two to three years from now. Um, I, I would say, 
you know, go back to something I said earlier, I think small models are really interesting. I think models that are really efficient and great at what they're doing, um, even things around like generating video, um, generating 3D objects, like all of these things can be done with the huge foundation models that we all know, but they're also quickly being distilled into something that you can run, you know, on a small, a small cluster or even a laptop. And I feel like the infrastructure around that is still very nascent. Um, and it's going to create opportunities for just about anything. And so we are looking at lots of opportunities, you know, pulling it back to like the cloud, cloud ecosystem, things where you can have like, hey, I want to chat with my infrastructure. What does that look like? What does the model look like to have to understand, you know, all of my systems, all of my, my code base, everything that's going on in production? Like, okay, that maybe should be something that's quite fast. It's, you know, fine-tuned to my individual system. And we feel like that's a place where we're going to deploy lots of capital. So I don't know, you know, there's going to continue to be lots and lots of breakthroughs with AI. But to me, most of the exciting things, at least for startups, is around small models, not, not big foundation models. I'm excited about two areas right now. One is the enhancement in the reasoning layer, both at large and small models. I think it's best exemplified by what OpenAI uh, GPT-40 uh, is doing, um, you know, you want highly accurate responses to any of your queries, you're willing to wait longer to get them. So I think this reasoning layer will be applied to both close, other closed source models and open source models. Second, and the, the biggest shift that we've seen over the past year is the rise of AI agents. I think almost any company today needs to be thinking about uh, co-pilots, which can automate you know, somewhere between 20 and 40% of the work, and full autopilots that are closer to 80 and 90%. For these application layer companies to be successful as being AI agent first, there needs to be an infrastructure layer that enables it. That could be the models themselves and the enhanced reasoning. It could be the runtime environments, code sandboxes, headless browser infrastructure. It could be the AI multi-agent framework companies like Leta, it could be the data management in the AI memory itself. How does the agent know which data to call at the right time to be effective? So for me, you know, very cool stuff going on with reasoning and then also AI agent infrastructure. Um, yeah, so I'm going to repeat a couple things, but I think number one related to small models, edge compute. So if you can actually move the model to the data or to the edge where the user is, what does that enable? Um, you know, I think that Cloudflare has done a great job, um, you know, building what we'd call a CDN, but what about the data delivery network, the DDN? So I think it would be interesting, um, you know, to kind of reframe how we deliver uh, content and data to users, and I think small models is a way to do that. And then, like Astasia, super interested in this idea of agentic infrastructure. If you have um, more, uh, well, we used to call them bots, but now we call them agents, so it's cooler. Um, but if you have more things on the internet that are not humans taking action, Number one, uh, what kind of new complexities does that bring to organizations, specifically around kind of security? Uh, and then number two, what type of infrastructure should we build for those agents so that they can be effective? Uh, and I think, like Astasia mentioned, this idea of a headless browser um, or um, you know things that sort of put guardrails on the agents. Um, as someone that came from the database world, the non-determinism of LLMs is so frustrating. Um, but it also is com it's very interesting to me that what we try to do is make them a little bit more deterministic. And I also wonder if that's a mistake. So that's something I think about a lot, which is, isn't one of the big, biggest, most powerful things about large language models, their kind of creative aspect. And the more that we guardrail them, the more we're taking away the non-determinism. Just to tie together a few points that you guys made, which is talking about uh, you know, new chips and semiconductors and like lower level systems with the edge. I think one of the biggest constraints of moving models really to the edge is the hardware component. If you have an iPhone, there's only so many models you can run on it where it'll still work, right? So there's an interweaving between what we hope to see in hardware and movement to the edge. And, you know, frankly, we're, we're just not there yet. We need a lot more work. You know, most of the folks here this week are infra builders like you know when you talk about things like you know agents and you know things that are needed to enable those agents how, how do you advise founders you know around building sort of general purpose horizontal infrastructure tools versus you know focusing on particular applications or use cases and and starting to look more vertically integrated right like how how do you all think you know think about that 
Um, and, and is there any advice you'd provide to founders who are kind of trying to figure out, hey, like, you know, I have some interesting infrastructure tooling, but like, where am I going to focus it first? That's a hard question. I think you can actually start either way. And I think there's really good examples of products that start highly vertical and then expand more horizontally and vice versa. Great example is GPUs, which were built for graphical, you know, graphical processing and gaming. And now we're using them for AI. So they found a really great second, second use case. Um, but I think uh, the same can be said for infrastructure. So uh, one of the companies I work with that I'm really excited about is a company called Tiger Beetle. And they're a database specifically designed for uh, fintech applications. But it turns out a lot of the decisions that they made to be highly optimized for those workloads can also be applied to other things. And so um, I do think an amount of focus is important at first, because if you try to serve everyone, you'll serve no one. And then you know, once you kind of nail that initial use case, you can find adjacencies. So I actually am very excited about verticalized infrastructure right now, which serves like a very highly specialized um, either vertical or use case. To totally agree. I think if you start out from the very beginning doing something that's too horizontal, you end up with this boil of the ocean problem. And you never really get a customer that absolutely loves what you do. It's hard to lock down design partners. Um, so I think that the best strategy is finding something where you can nail a vertical early on, but then there's a potential to expand to lots of different horizontal use cases as your you know, company begins to scale and you have a wider set of customers. Um, but in the beginning of, of any startup, the, the most important thing, maybe after capital and a great team, is great feedback. And you're only going to get that if you're really nailing someone's use case. You know, the three of you have invested in cloud native companies for a long while. Like, is there anything different about building an AI or cloud native AI company today from building a you know, cloud native company 10 years ago? The AI writes the code. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, think, I think in some ways, you know, you have to move very, very quickly. Like, that's, that's really the difference. I mean, I think that, that so much infrastructure is being rebuilt. The incumbents on down are changing the way everything works. And so that's a huge opportunity. But it, I think it's also, you know, if you're a founder, that's a lot of risk. Because you can be working on something for six months, and then OpenAI comes out with something that competes, competes with you. So I just think that the level of competition around this infrastructure is higher than I've ever seen before. Um, but the fundamentals of it haven't changed, right? You still need to hit real use cases for real customers and eventually get to scale. It's just that the stakes have gotten really, really high. Yeah, we talked about the innovation velocity. It's faster than ever before. You know, I led the Series A in Solo.io, which is a really cool open source networking and API gateway company. You know, back then, you know, velocity of which that layer seven was changing was in cycles of 18 months to two years. Now it's literally every week with AI that we talk about. Um, if you are a founder considering something, building something in AI, I would go to the fundamentals, which are what are your three or four unique insights into the pain point or the space that gives you a competitive advantage that you will inform your product and go to market motion. You have to really, really know the space because guess what? There's going to be 20 other teams literally doing the exact same thing either already or about to. So. Um, have a lot of faith in yourself if you're a founder, but get those insights, talk to customers to further inform it, and then do failure analysis to understand what hypotheses that you had were not true. Yeah, I would just say that a lot of the things that we think are super novel right now are going to be highly normalized in one year, two years, five years, 10. I think that's what happened to cloud. It's what happened to mobile before that. Um, Uber was called a mobile mobile company. I think we'd all considered a transportation company today. A lot of companies that were considered internet companies because they had a dot com. Uh, you know, are now considered, you know, named by their vertical. And I think that's happening a little bit here. And it's this idea of like kind of innovation normalization. Um, these things feel novel. AI feels novel, but I think it's going to become table stakes the same way that cloud is table stakes for companies building today. So, um, you know, we're an amazing, you know, we're at a conference today surrounded by kind of at, you know, the top technologists don't fall behind, stay up with what's happening because it's one of the most exciting times ever. Oh, open up for audience questions now if anyone wants to come up and, and ask a question. Like, we got a lot of investor brain power on stage here, so don't be shy. Uh, but, you know, whether you're a founder or you're thinking about starting something or you just want to get the investor perspective, 
uh, you know, feel free to step up to the microphone and, and we'll take a few questions in the last few minutes of the session. You opened up a little bit talking about how the data play is super important, the strategies that a company may have to actually even take advantage of a lot of these AI products. What are some things that you're excited about from a strategy standpoint or a product standpoint and how an enterprise reshapes their data strategy to actually be able to hook up tools, do RAG, actually gain insights from their data? Great question, thank you so much. Um, the three things that we're super excited about right now is you know, large enterprises have a whole bunch of unstructured data. Historically, data engineers didn't really know how to work with that type of data, right? They're very accustomed to building traditional transactional data connectors to get data into Snowflake. But unstructured data, you actually need to understand the data type and have parsing and extraction of it with a really high level of efficacy because once again, data quality is crucial. So technologies that enable the understanding of unstructured data, two is, I'm tired of Spark. Aren't you guys tired of Spark? Like, who wants to work in a JVM? Oh my God. You know, you don't want to staff these teams. You're thinking about how you can, you know, up level everyone and just frankly make their life better. So we are looking at modern data processing engines that have multimodal data as a first principle to really take down Spark and Databricks. Um, and then the third area that we're excited about is the curation of the data, either for pre-training a model that's best fit for a vertical use case. We invested in a company called Datology that I'm on the board of that does that. Go check them out. Um, but also, we're looking at how do you use this data now for post-training, like fine-tuning, so that you don't have to do all the upfront work, but still get that benefit of building a model or an AI agent that's best fit for your enterprise data. Uh, yeah, I would just say return of the blob storage. I'm a big database person, but I think blob storage is where everyone's putting this unstructured multimodal data. Uh, so I'm really excited about uh, companies that are um, building kind of S3 compatible uh, blob storage solutions. Um, and this is where a lot of people end up putting their training inference data. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Satish. Uh, so thanks for all the uh, information and whatever you are sharing so far. Um, so AI is top in the market right now, right? Uh, at least in the last one year or plus. Um, so for like a startup companies who are like trying to invest on, like trying to build up a product or like a FinOps product or like a cloud native product, uh, as a VC, uh, what will be your first preference? Let's say you have a cloud native product uh, and then like, there's a FinOps product and there is a AI product. Uh, let's say like three are like three individual projects and then they don't talk to each other and uh, as a VZ uh, when you think about this potential like where you think like is it the right product uh, like eventually like the three product is equal but uh, how do you pick it uh, that's what I don't know like what do you give as a preference or like how do you uh, choose a product as a VC um, when you want to like a uh, uh, is your question fund, for an investment opportunity, yeah, it yeah. is the same product and one is AI native and one is not enabled yeah, by AI? Yeah, one is AI native and one is cloud native. So how do you like a pick one? Um, I mean, I, th I think the real answer is like, uh, you know, going forward, I don't think we'll have to choose. Like, I think the winning solution is, is going to pass both of yeah. those, right, yeah, in the yeah, same yeah. way that, you know, all companies are digital, all companies are on the cloud, all companies are gonna be, you know, they're cloud native, now they're gonna be AI native. So I don't think that this is an either or. I think all of these trends kind of converge. Um, you know, think about any consumer company, they all have a mobile app, right? They all have they all have these other things. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I just, we, we don't, like we already, in our deal flow today, we feel like everything has some what kind of AI saying, story. Sorry. And I just predict that that's, that's where the world's going. Okay, so you get uh, try to get best out of each thing and then try to combine. Uh, like absolutely. If there is anything, any product, build it. All right, we're going to try to sneak in maybe one, one or two questions uh, before the session's out. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Joseph. I work at Lambda Labs. My question was, um, Eric, I know that you worked as a software engineer at Google before you became a venture uh, or a VC. I'm Natalie, systems engineer before VC. 
Astasia, I ran out of time to like search through employment history. I worked at Cisco, all good. Yeah, okay, <laughs> but yeah, I guess I was just curious, um, that uh, previous experience, how does that inform your investment strategy? Has that tailored it? Does it help you like see past the fluff? Um, yeah, question for all three of you, uh, because I do find that uh, you've all been in this space for quite a while. So um, yeah, I was just curious if that has like informed your investment strategy in any capacity. Yeah, I mean, I'm here as someone who is, is still a working engineer. Like we have an engineering team at GV that deals with data and just data about startups and predictions and things like that. I'm like the steward of that team. They don't let, let me write the code anymore, but at least get to be around those people. And I think that, you know, in terms of my investments, I am most comfortable when I'm sitting down with a technical founder and we're kind of thinking about product and roadmaps and things like that. What that really meant for my career is I had a lot to learn in my earlier years about distribution and sales and all these other things. Um, but when I'm doing an early stage company, I'm definitely gravitating to what is the technology problem that's being solved. And so I think, you know, especially what I learned from early days of Google in terms of, you know, building technology at scale, doing it at a uber high quality, and also just how to hire amazing people. I mean, I did probably hundreds of interviews before jumping over to the VC side and just being able to understand, like, what is an amazing founder and what is an amazing product and an amazing roadmap. That's all, you know, those are the strengths I rely upon and still make, making inv new investments today. Yeah, I think it, it helps tremendously, especially if you're doing early stage investing, where the people that are walking in the door might not have a product built. Maybe they have something that they're working with, but it's usually two or three people, technical. Um, and I think that helps me um, be leveraged to them to have worked in these fields, but also helps me understand the product. And I think it makes me a better investor if I'm able to play with the product. Um, relate to it and, and diligence it, quite frankly, because these things are deeply technical. You also have to you know, be able to tell A from B, and um, I think it helps us make better decisions. Yeah, one of the things I would just say in closing is that I think the three folks up here, they, they really blend the technical understanding with a lot of investor acumen. So I think you know, if, if you talk to them, you'd find that they, they get it when it comes to technical products and, and helping, especially, you know, work with technical founders to figure out early go-to-market and really building a business. So I so want to thank the three of you for your time and insights today. And, you know, please find them uh, if you're a founder, if you're just interested in the investor perspective, find them, you know, either after the session or throughout the week. Thanks, everyone.